Welcome back to our channel. Please be reminded that this video does not reflect on any opinions from the DC team and is only published for information purposes. Video courtesy of Learning Events Series, Facebook page. Please check our video description for link. An online lecture and open forum regarding the Dumaguete Smart City Reclamation Project was held live on July 27, 2021 via Zoom and Facebook Live. Dr. Rene A. Abisamis, a marine biologist, lectured on the environmental impact of the reclamation. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, the first event in our uh, learning series. Uh, the, the goal of, of this series is for us to get the most information that we can have about this issue that's, uh, that's currently facing us, okay? So today's event is uh, we're concentrating on the environmental impact of the proposed reclamation to Dumaguete shoreline, all right? I take it everyone's read the, uh, the rules, okay? So um, let me talk to you about our speaker today, about the environmental impact. Um, as much as we wanted to have uh, opposing views, both sides uh, or differing views, um, uh, the other speakers uh, were not available to speak. So speaking today is uh, Dr. Rene Abistamis. Okay, um, Dr. Abisamis is a, is a renowned expert uh, with more than 20 years of experience in the marine biology field. I 40 plus uh, published works. Um, he's uh, currently with uh, SUACREM, okay, Angelo King Research Institute, and he's also an adjunct prof um, faculty member, right? Uh, at the uh, Silliman Institute of uh, uh, Marine, uh, uh, Silliman University Marine Lab, right? Uh, Institute of Environmental and Marine Sciences. Uh, he is, I feel, uh, um, one of the most knowledgeable experts about what faces us because um, his last few papers or a lot of his papers are about marine protected areas and specifically their interconnectivity how they all are interconnected how they all affect each other how um one marine preserve feeds off the, each other right so um without much more let me uh hand it over to dr abisamis and um, questions will be allowed to be asked in the question and answer at the end of this presentation. Dr. Abisamis, after you. Thank you, Rene, for that uh, introduction. Um, I just need to share my video. Um, can the host please uh, enable the screen sharing? Can everyone see the screen? Rene, can you can you see the screen? <clears throat> so good evening, everyone. Um, I'm uh, I'm Rene Abisamis. I'm a marine biologist, and I've been asked to speak about um, direct and indirect impacts of the Smart City Reclamation Project on marine ecosystems of Dumaguete. Um, uh, thank you very much to the Lions Club and the Rotary, the Rotary Club of Dumaguete South. Uh, for for this uh, opportunity to uh, speak in front of you today tonight, okay. um, I'm I feel like I I'm you know I have some authority to speak about this matter. I I have lived in I lived and worked in Dumaguete over the last twenty years and have intimate knowledge of the marine ecosystems in this region. Um, okay. So. According to the announcement, um, I'm supposed to talk about environmental impacts 
But what I really want to emphasize is another term called ecological impacts. Because there's a distinction between the two, environmental versus ecological. When we deal with environmental impacts, most of the time, we're thinking of the non-living surroundings in which the living things operate. For example, just the seawater, just, just the earth, you know. But in reality, um, it's really an ecology. We're, we're in, it's really the relationship of the living things that are in that environment, the relationship among them, and the, their relationship with, with the environment. And uh, the living things include man, of course, as this figure shows. When we deal with ecology, um, we, in, we, it's, we can't escape the fact that we will also deal with biodiversity, which is really the, the kinds of living things in that environment or the biological community. Um, especially here in the tropics uh, and the Philippines and the central Visayas, were considered to be in the center of marine biodiversity. So um, in this talk, I'll keep, try to keep it simple. Um, there are only three main parts to it. First, I just want to establish how big that Dumaguete Smart City project really is, at least according to um, the descriptions of all of us. Um, two, um, I want to establish that there will be massive direct ecological damage with, which would have indirect impacts. And you could think of this, uh, these impacts in terms of three things. One is impacts to the ecological systems and the services that they give to us. The marine protection, which uh, you know, is part of my expertise. And in the last bit, because a lot of people have been asking me about this, um, it's, it's a question of whether this damage is irreversible or is it, is it manageable. In the end, um, I'll just uh, give a few um, conclusions. So um, you might have seen this map. Um, the outline, the, uh, the broken line shows you um, how big the project is. In, uh, in the information available to us, it's, they say that it's 174 hectares. Um, from this satellite image, you could you notice that uh, it's about 7.1 kilometers long, which in Dumaguete terms would be the same, almost the same distance from the Dumaguete public market to Valencia public market, which is another town. Um, 174 hectares um, would also be something like 100 times the size of the recently completed uh, reclamation, the Pantaman. Because it's so long, it will occupy probably 85% of the coast of, uh, of, this, of the city. And the, and, the, and the coastline is only about eight and a half kilometers long. It, will, um, it may affect seven coastal barangays, which would have 38,000 people. If you still have a hard time um, imagining how big this is, think in terms of basketball, basketball courts, the size is about the size is about four thousand basketball courts. Um, if you're from Manila, listening from Manila, it's about ten lunetas. And if you're uh, doing the daily grind on EDSA, it's about the same distance from Cubao to Guadalupe. So it's it's massive. It's really big because it's so big. It's almost inevitable that there will be massive ecological damage. I've been emphasizing that, and. Unfortunately, when you rebuild or when you reclaim um, in close to shore, especially in the tropical marine environment, you will be encountering coral reefs and you will be encountering seagrass beds and other productive ecosystems like stock bottoms, you know, which are a source of uh, ecosystem services. In the case of this uh, huge reclamation project, there are also four marine protected areas that will be affected as the map shows. I'll get back to that later. But um, it's hard to estimate really how big the damage would be. Um, I think if you check satellite images, there will be more confidence to understand how much seagrass ecosystems and um, what we call algal bed ecosystems will, may be affected. And we think that maybe up to 65% of seagrass ecosystems will be affected, if, uh, affected which is equivalent to 1,500 basketball courts. We're more confident there because uh, seagrass are more shallow. They're, easily, they're easier to see um, from satellite images. Whereas coral reef ecosystems, um, 
because they 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 uh, the 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 shelf is usually sloping, and you know um, um, satellite images can only look down so far into the water. Um, there are various estimates available um, about how much uh, coral reef area is there really in Dumaguete, but the best available information uh, from satellite images which is a new product, Allen Coral Atlas, which was just recently released, um, suggests that up, up to 60% of the coral ecosystems in Dumaguete may be affected. And that ranges from anywhere from 1,000 to more than 2,000 basketball courts, the equivalent of uh, the size of uh, those uh, basketball courts. Um, the Cor Allen Coral Atlas estimate um, suggests that there may be about 100 hectares of coral reef that may be affected by that project. So it's huge. We're talking about hundreds of hectares. Okay. And they're not dead ecosystems. You know? um, um, there might have been some uh, misinformed statements um, or false statements um, because in reality, it's a living, very complex ecosystem just outside of uh, anyone's doorstep in Dumaguete, literally. Okay. Um, Dumaguete is one of those places that's, that's still quite lucky, you know, one of those cosmopolitan cities in the Philippines still have, uh, that still has relatively intact uh, marine um, ecosystems. We're talking about seagrass beds that host animals uh, like invertebrates. You have coral reefs, really healthy coral reefs, um, less than 50 meters from shore. And they're highly complex ecosystems. They're not very, you know, it's typical of... Uh, the marine tropics. No? It's, you're talking about special ecosystems. Um, as, as the photos show, you know, these photos were just taken less than two weeks ago. Um, and it's, it's a thriving ecosystem. It's a, these, are, these corals are alive. They're not bleached. They're not dead. Okay? Um, so a, a massive reclamation like that will, will really impact those what we call foundational ecosystems made up of coral, seagrass, even maybe the mangroves and seaweeds may be affected, um, especially in this area, which is really a biodiversity hotspot. You know, this, the central, this part of the central Philippines is, is really, really important and uh, special because not only does it have so many species hosted in these uh, unique environments, but also they are, you know, they're, they're close to passage, important passageways for, for big animals, you know, megafauna, we call it megafauna. Um, just to enumerate, you know, there's a there's a 150 more than 150 coral species already documented, nine species of seagrass, 20 mangroves, 20 mangrove species, seaweed species, more than 200 species of fish, lots of invertebrates, urchins, starfish, sea cucumbers, and then many uh, some of these species are actually either threatened by extinction, endangered, or protected by law or international conventions. Um, because there are so few of them already. That includes the turtles, giant clams, dolphins, and whales. Okay. Um, also, all of those photos, that were, you know, even the, blue, the photo of the blue whale here, uh, which now has a nickname, uh, Bughao, those were taken in, just in front of Dumaguete. Bughao, the blue whale, for example, that, that photo was taken less than a kilometer from the Rizal Boulevard. But, you know, what does it mean to us, okay? Okay, they're nice to look at. Um, but really, they offer what you call important ecosystem services. And massive reclamation will basically kill all of that. Um, so if you like to eat fish or invertebrates, you're lucky because there's a reef in front of you. There's a, there's a relatively impact marine environment. And you have to be thankful for the service that they provide to, to, to the fish itself so that they can breed and, and continue their life cycle. If you like snorkeling and scuba diving, you're lucky. It's just, you know, very close. Um, scientific and educational opportunities. The prime example of that is the Siliman University uh, Marine Lab, which is now more than 40 years old. You know, it's, 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 you can imagine how many students have gone through the halls of uh, that institution and became marine biologists. You know? And then there are certain things that are more difficult to quantify, you know, in terms of pesos or dollars, you know, like climate change mitigation, you know, 
you know, there's 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 a big value to that, but we don't we probably take it for granted um, in terms of storm protection, even carbon sequestration. You know, the seagrass, for example, absorbs a lot of the carbon that tries to mitigate that can try to mitigate uh, climate change. But perhaps the most difficult to to quantify would be that heritage value. You know, the, by preserving these environments, you actually leave something for the next generation. You know? So how do you put a, a dollar sign or a peso sign to that? Right? And ultimately, it's about um, the real, to me, it's about not so much in terms of absolute value, how much is it really worth compared to, let's say, a project as big as a smart city and the economic, purported economic benefits of that. It's, it, it's also the relative value. For many inhabitants of Dumaguete, um, close to a thousand, it's basically a source of food and livelihood. And that becomes all the more important in this pandemic. I, today, I just saw um, a short film called Mananagatsa Dumaguete, and I think that perfectly captures um, what that environment is really about for people who really depend on it. We don't know how um, they're going to do this, right? It's such a massive, massive project. Um, there has been some information coming from different sources that maybe, maybe they're gonna use uh, what you call cutter suction dredgers, which will basically get uh, material from an, the adjacent seafloor and then dump it on, on the shallow areas to make the land, to, to, to do the reclamation. And I think that's really, really um, unfortunate if they do that because aside from your coral reefs, aside from your shallow seagrass beds, there is also what you call uh, deeper areas. We, what in, in, in marine ecology, we call them mesophotic areas. Quick way to understand them is they're soft sediment ecosystems. They're, they're, that's why they're the prime targets for this kind of reclamation because you know it's a soft bottom. And we know from our studies, for example, that um, if you drop cameras all the way to 75 meters in this case, there's life there. You know, there's, there's lots of uh, fish, there's some soft corals. Um, there, e even at 28 meters, there's, there's a lot of life. There's uh, uh, food fish to, 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 to uh, capture. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really productive environment, even if you don't have that coral structure or the seagrass beds. Okay? So if su cutter suction dredgers will be used, that's basically the end of a lot of these ecosystems. If cutter suction dredgers will be used, there is also this other problem, which is sediment suspension. For such a big project, um, using that kind of uh, method, it's inevitable that a lot of that sediment will make it to the neighboring areas of Dumaguete. Um, not only that, because not only because of the, the amount of material, but also because of the strong currents here. Um, this region gets hit by what uh, marine scientists know as the Bohol Jet, which is basically just water from the Pacific crossing the Bohol Sea, hitting these islands and then trying to make its way to the Sulu Sea. So aside from the Tanyon Strait, which may be affected by silt creep up uh, the strait during the, the flood tide, okay? A lot of the, the towns, or maybe at least two towns in the south may be affected, uh, Kong and Darwin. Um, in my accounting, I think that because of the strength of that current, maybe even Apo Island, uh, protected landscape and seascape may, re, uh, may be affected if uh, they're not careful with the, with the controlling um, sediment, uh, sediment dispersal. Um, in my accounting, I also note that aside from Tanyan Strait and Apo Island being national marine protected areas, there are 12 locally managed MPAs in these uh, neighboring local governments, uh, which may be affected by, by the reclamation. And that's, that's something to point out because that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a shame if the sediment will reach um, um, those MPAs because those MPAs also have coral and corals, you know, one of their, one of, one of their enemies is siltation they'll die with siltation. Okay, since we're talking about MPAs, um, 
I would like to focus on them now. I, as I mentioned earlier, there are four MPAs in Dumaguete, and these are these four MPAs, the yellow, um, the yellow ones, if you could see them. And because the city government recognized the importance of these marine ecosystems, the value of these marine ecosystems to its people, the city actually created four of these MPAs in 2001, 2011, 2013, and 2014. And you'd, you'd, you should look at who, who, you know, who, who, um, who actually supported this back in the day. Um, um, it's meaning it's not a creation of marine biologists. It's actually a co-management arrangement between the city and the local uh, people in the barangays. Um, if those four MPAs will get buried by the reclamation, as this figure suggests, there will be immediate loss of accumulated biodiversity. Okay, accumulated meaning there's a time element to it. And there will always, there was also, there will also be a loss of what I, what I would call fish population recovery. That's what marine reserves do, or marine protected areas do. They they stop fishing, you know, they they outlaw fishing, and over time, because the fish and whatever else lives in the marine protected area um, can survive, they will accumulate in terms of their diversity, and they and populations of fish, for example will grow older, grow bigger, and become much more abundant, okay? That takes a while. From um, our understanding of um, long-term studies of protected areas like Apo Island, that takes about 30 to 40 years to fully mature, okay? And even at 20 years, you know, midway through what we call a full mature state, like Banilat Sanctuary, that's the oldest one established in 2001. And this is a video of uh, Banilat Sanctuary taken not even 10 days ago, or about 10 days ago. Once you have that accumulation of fish biomass, what we call fish biomass, um, and mature fish in that case, these places become um, important spawning grounds and important sources of fish larvae. And that's what helps boost uh, fish populations. Okay, so, so the city recognized that 20 years ago. Okay. And here, this is a little bit more complicated. It's a bit more, um, it's a bit more complicated um, story behind what marine protected areas really do. Remember I told you that they can accumulate fish populations and they fish, fish grow older, bigger, mature, they produce more eggs, especially the female fish. Once that happens, um, they export their larvae because these larvae, as, as this figure shows, can get um, dispersed by ocean currents or even the lar some of the larvae can even swim, you know. And that connection among places, for example, among MPAs is, and, or for example, an MPA to fishing grounds, that's what we would call connectivity. And this, this connectivity, this process, is essential to completing the life cycles of, of these uh, um, animals, so these fish that live in different places. So the connectivity sustains populations in different places. And if it happens to be a fished population, meaning a, a population that is open to fishing, that can boost fisheries. Okay? From our studies uh, using uh, DNA, okay, we know that connectivity among populations of fish, for example, in marine protected areas, is strongest within a radius of 35 kilometers. If you draw a circle of, uh, with a radius of 35 kilometers from the reclamation site, my count is there will be 46 marine protected areas, including Apo Island. And that means that you would expect that and marine protected areas in three provinces, Cebu, Negros Oriental, and Siquijor would be highly connected in the system. So if you remove you know, those four MPAs, you know, um, bury those four MPAs, um, you basically weaken that connectivity structure. And that, that to me does not only contradict uh, city law, the city ordinance, but also um, contradicts the national policy to 
to strengthen marine protected areas or specifically networks of marine protected areas. Okay. So that deserves a hard look because marine protected areas take a while to recover. You have, it's a big investment uh, by, by government. And then you know, once you start uh, those uh, cutter suction barges, cutter suction um, dredgers, if that's the way to do it, then it will be, it will be uh, done uh, in a very, fairly short amount of time. Okay, um, I think this is uh, probably one of the last slides. Um, I've always been asked, you know, is this damage, can this damage be reversed? Is this reversible? Can you just simply re relocate, you know, the corals from where they may be buried to another place, build artificial reefs, you know, how big should that be? Where do you put them, you know? And, and you know, with 85% of the coastline, um, you know, that could be affected by this with siltation, it's hard to imagine where you would put them, right? Because a, lot, a big area would be affected. But let's say for argument's sake, that um, you can prob probably do that. You know? My answer would be something like this. And I use uh, um, scientific studies to, to, uh, to, uh, and, and opinion to, to back this up. My answer is it's not reversible, you know, simply because the, the restoration techniques, what we call ecosystem res restoration techniques, are not yet there. You know, they're not yet fully developed meaning they're not yet fully developed for the scales that we're talking about here. It's not cost effective, okay? And I'll, and I'll show it to you um, in, 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 a few, in, a, in a few more minutes. The other thing to point out is this. It is true that there are restoration projects out there, but unfortunately, most of them have not been sustained. You know, in, this, is, this is a global review. Uh, most of them have not lasted more than two years. And that is in stark contrast to what we know about how long does it take for coral reefs to recover. Corals, for example, coral co what we call coral cover. Our data in Apo Island suggests that it will take about 30 years for something like Apo Island, which suffered severe storm damage, the marine reserve there suffered severe storm damage. That might, that might take up to 30 years in order to get back its, uh, its previous state. Okay, so, so one thing to remember, right? 30 years is probably your time scale if you're going to talk about rebuilding um, a coral ecosystem, okay? Okay, to, to make my point, I'll show you these uh, figures. Okay, um, these are three boxes. One is really big and the other one is really small. I don't know if you can see that one. One is about scaled up to about 100 hectares. One is scaled to one hectare, and the other one is scaled to 0 0.01 hectare or 100 square meters. Okay, a million square meters, 10,000 square meters, and 100 square meters. Okay, you're probably wondering why am I looking at boxes? To me, I did this because I wanted to illustrate what would be lost in terms of coral reef area based on, let's say, the coral, uh, island coral atlas. This is, this is how much it is, right? 100 hectares or so. The usual size of coral reef restoration projects is this, 100 square meters, according to that global review, okay? So if you're going to start here, um, forget it, right? But there's a little bit of hope. Um, it says here that, it's, and it says in that global review that the biggest project that we have so far in the world is about one hectare. That's the maximum. And fortunately, um, a world expert on the matter, Dr. Lori Raimundo of the University of Guam, um, even wrote to the city to say that, look, don't push through with it because I'm a coral reef restoration expert. And if you do that, it's going to be so costly and maybe impossible to do, to restore. And I looked at uh, Dr. Raimundo's numbers. Her number says that she has a project in Guam, which is 1.6 hectares of mild restoration, meaning it's not completely damaged. They just have to restore it to a certain state. And that's already costing them the equivalent of about 43 million pesos per 1.6 hectares, you know, which works out uh, for three years, you know, 
which works out to 27 million pesos for three years. Okay. But we're talking about a 30-year time frame for coral recovery. So you'll have to multiply that by 10 to assuming that the cost doesn't change, right? And just for one hectare, you will be spending 270 million just to see that through one hectare. What do you think will happen if you have to do 100 hectares? Okay. For three years, given this math, it will be about 2.7 billion and 27 billion if you want to use the 30-year time frame. I forgot to mention that the project is 23 billion pesos. Okay, summary and conclusion. First, to me, no doubt, you know, if this, is, this pushes through uh, the way it's been described, um, it will result in massive, in monumental, irreversible loss of what I think is called the ecological capital, the ecological heritage, and even the ecological investments of Dumaguete City that currently benefits many of its citizens and also many in the region. If you destroy that, the, those who are benefiting in the city and the region will also be negatively affected. So the city government should really reconsider this project. You know, take a long, careful, hard look. Okay, so I can I can you know emphasize that um, more. You know, and if ever this goes through an environmental impact assessment, um, which it should, you know, we just like two hundred more than two hundred marine scientists uh, over the weekend had a conference um, in the Philippines. And they said that, you know, um, yes, let's, if this goes through the process, then this should be really, really dealt with with utmost scrutiny, okay? The government agencies concerned should really think about this uh, according to, to, that, to, the, to the law, you know, as an environmentally critical project within what can be termed an ecologically critical area. And as required by law, this has to really go through the careful process of environmental impact, which includes uh, impact, impact assessment, which includes public consultation and participation at many steps. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Abisamis. Uh, that was a very complete, uh, thorough, and yet simple explanation of. Uh, in fact, uh, we can expect uh, to see if this project goes through. Um, you covered a lot of our advanced questions. Um, you gave a, a, a simple explanation of a possible cost. And uh, yes, looks like much more than the project's worth. Uh, you uh, explained where they would be getting that material to fill in the islands, all right? That was also one of the advanced questions. Um, and uh, you, I think uh, what was very clear also there is uh, you emphasize the interconnectivity within all of this, all right? You see that much more, but there were also questions about would our MPAs uh, in Cibulan, in Bakong be affected by all of this? And again, according to your studies, uh, within that radius, yes, very, very likelihood. Okay, so the network, the network is very important. Um, I still got a couple of other questions for you, though. Uh, let me start off with uh, one from the question and answer. Well, I'll actually go with two from the question and answer and one from the advanced questions. All right, uh, so we have sort of different points of view. Uh, this one's from Apple. A more, all right, um, and she just like a clarification on your opinion. Why do you think Dumaguete is, uh, in quotes, quite lucky? Yes, you did say that. It's quite lucky that despite the inflow of wastewater and garbage from it being a relatively dense city, why is it still considered quite lucky? Hmm. Uh, is my mic on? Okay. Um, 
I guess that's a personal viewpoint uh, to begin with. Um, I guess I, when I said that, I'm thinking of uh, the Dumagetnons being lucky to have such a relatively intact uh, coastal environment. Okay. But that doesn't mean, of course, that, that there are other problems, okay. that there are no other problems. Um, so, so we're lucky in that respect, um, having, having a nice coastal environment, but we may have to do better in preserving that environment. And we may also have to do better in making sure that other problems don't be, right? So, um, or else you'll be less lucky, right? So, so, yeah. so um, it's a personal viewpoint. That's a quick, uh, quick answer. And, um, and it's because of that, uh, my appreciation of the coastal environment. A bit of a follow-up question for that. Um, in your experience then, you know, it's very r rare that you do actually see such a developed port having this amount of relatively undamaged ecological systems around the area, right? Yeah, um, but, but also it has changed a lot. I remember the first time I set foot on Dumaguete, um, which was uh, 22 years ago, maybe. I can still remember that uh, if you stand uh, on the boulevard, uh, or even the pier, you can still enter the pier before and look down. The waters can, you know, most of the time it's crystal clear. Um, well, uh, these days, uh, there'll be times when it's clear and there'll be other times when it's not clear. So I agree with your points that uh, we also have to um, uh, manage uh, water quality, right? I to totally agree with that. But um, I don't uh, see the point when you have to bury so much of the ecosystems and then manage water quality after, right? I don't see much point in that, okay? So, so yeah. Okay, um, let, me, uh, let me proceed to another question. Um, again, for those of you who asked the questions, I'm sort of going to skip the questions that have already been answered, of course, in the uh, in, in his talk. All right, um, but I, I'll still mention some of them to clarify uh, some points. All right, I have a question here, um, a practical question. When uh, the mayor says DNR will consult before the ECC is issued. Which DNR would that be? Would it um, be local, regional? Um, it's EMB, right? Uh, ultimately, um, who will have to do the um, EIA? Um, it goes through the region, I think, to, 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 to some extent. I'm not just not so sure, but ultimately, um, it's signed off by the department secretary, right? So there's also in the if I. I mean, the PRA process is new to me um, because it's going to go through that. And there's also a requirement there where in the uh, Community Environment uh, Natural Resources Office will also be involved, um, which is uh, in the Maguete. Uh, when, when they um, um, try to get an area clearance, I think that's part of the process. Um, but as far as I know, it's not there yet. It's too early, you know. Um, the, as far as we know, it's uh, the they haven't. I, I don't think the MOU has been signed even. So, so yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, actually, uh, I think uh, more about the process will be answered by Attorney Benjamin in our further lecture series. All right. Um, let me proceed with. Sorry if I'm sort of jumping around with the questions, but I'm really looking at the ones that have not been addressed in your talk. Okay, I have one from Zorik, um, and it's, uh, can we apply the 13,000 peso cost per square meter of environmental and social impact to this development, just like the suggested fine imposed by the government for the damage done to Apo Reef National Park in the incident in 2003? I think the 2003 incident was that American destroyer, probably. But there have been Operation. other precedents where, okay. um, ah, no, no, the American destroyer was Tubataha. 
I think Apple Reef may have been one of the liverboard boats then. Yeah. Okay, but uh, yes, I, I'm aware of that. They, uh, they applied a 13,000 peso cost per square meter as an impact. But going yeah. that uh, way, it would be... Oh, well, um, I don't know the answer to that um, and who's going to do the valuation. Um, I don't think any valuation, formal valuation has been done. Um, and it might be too early for that. Um, if, but if you look at the literature, there are various estimates you know, on what's the per unit area of um, economic value of, uh, of coral reefs. There's, there's a large, uh, large um, range in the numbers. Um, and that's why I think that those kinds of questions will be better answered by a resource economist. Um, because they could probably explain why there's a big variation and um, what kind of uh, valuation uh, approach should be used for a, for a project like this. Um, so so I'm, not like, I'm not an economist, so, so that ventures into that uh, realm. So, so yeah. Well, well, I must say with your explanation, all right, your simple explanation of an estimation of the cost based on uh, Dr. Raimundo's work and the size of the area and your segregation of the area into the different parts. Uh, the 13,000, without even taking into account activity, the 13,000 seems rather a lowball figure. Okay. So yeah. Again, yeah. you're right. More and more data has to be, we need more data about that actually. Okay. Um, Hold on, let me uh, continue. Well, let me get you with one of the, uh, although you sort of answered this in the first question, um, from one of our advanced questioning questions, all right? Just so we have a uh, equitable distribution of questions, all right? So I'm going to recite this verbatim, all right? You've been protesting about the effect of reclamation to the corals. Why weren't you complaining about the lack of wastewater system in Dumaguete with the volumes that would reach 20 million liters per day before this reclamation project? This would surely destroy marine life in the near future, same as what is happening in Manila Bay. Shouldn't environmentalists focus more on this subject? Okay. Um, so the question is, should we focus more on wastewater treatment or stopping reclamation? That, that's the question, I guess, right? I, 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 I think I okay. just, I'd simplify that. Okay. And then whether and why wasn't I outraged by, by uh, the lack of wastewater treatment? Okay. Okay. Um, I guess you can compare the two if you ask me. Okay. Um, they, to some extent, they are comparable, but one is if you start the reclamation, you'll immediately, immediately, no doubt, kill a lot of that. In fact, maybe all of that. Wastewater treatment, I complained about it um, personally because I know um, when I first arrived in the Maguete, um, there was a semblance or there was a wastewater treatment facility in, in the, I think it's in the, um, near, the, near the church, right? And I think it was some um, government project from a long time ago, supported by aid money. And I thought that, that that was really impressive for a small city back then. But uh, over time, uh, I think that wasn't maintained by, by the government. And um, I think um, it also couldn't cope with the growth of the city. That why, that's why, unfortunately, um, we have that present situation now, which is a less than desirable situation when it comes to water quality. But why would you bury reefs and, and complete seagrass ecosystems just to create a wastewater facility, right? So, so why can't you just fix the wastewater facility? So that's, you know, that's, that, that would be my answer. Yeah. Uh, there's even a, a comment. Why can't we just implement the Clean Water Act? So, so there's a comment that, uh, uh, from 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 uh, from uh, attending, so yeah. So I'm a marine scientist. I I study the ocean. You know, I'm not in government, 
so so maybe um, you know um, I can I can wrap and but but uh, implementing um, Clean Water Act that's that's you know that's really not my um, you know that's not in my scope so yeah I, I think that will again as much as we're trying to get as much information as possible yes not exactly um, your expertise uh, but I'm sure again that will be covered by uh, Dr. Ben, uh, Attorney Ben Hamid, right? Um, well, this is really, you, yeah, you did answer this question in the talk. Uh, it's in the question and answer. But maybe you'd like to just expound a bit more on this. Because the question is whether you, we actually do have, you, if you have pic pictures and footage of the marine life and the coral in front of that area, okay? Well, it says Dumaguete Boulevard. Is it true that the corals yeah. are dead? Um, in Dumaguete in general or in front of the boulevard? Well, it, it, it's uh, Dumaguete Boulevard in front of that. So ah, in the front so of the you boulevard? Showed, you showed well, pictures of, of uh, the marine life in the other areas that were going to be reclaimed. It reclaimed. In front of the boulevard will not actually be reclaimed. Ah, okay. So the question is, um, in that area still, that, will, yeah. that won't be reclaimed, um, is it still alive? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, from personal experience, what I could tell you is um, the seagrass beds there are alive um, uh, because sometimes when you uh, take a boat uh, from even a small boat from the south to the north, you pass in the shallows and you'll see live seagrass. Even, uh, you can even see people uh, snorkeling from time to time, spearing small fish in the seagrass beds in the reef lot. But, per, uh, but personally, I haven't done any dives there um, because it's a little bit dangerous with the crossing ships. Um, but I was told by somebody from the Suleiman Marine Lab um, that there is a reef there that, uh, that, uh, that's still around um, last time they visited it. And um, during this whole um, issue about whether corals are dead or alive um, in, in the great Dumaguete area, um, they wanted to go there and check it out. Uh, but Rene, you might know, because you, you, you probably have do some dives there from time to time, uh, or might know of somebody who knows. But yeah, but personally, I don't know. Um, but I've heard that there, there are corals there. Uh, well, yeah, personal experience, actually, to the left of the pier, that sanctuary there, curly into the pier, yes, corals are still there. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And... To the right of the reclaimed area, actually in front of the Banica River, there's still some coral heads. Uh, and if you did see the picture of that, uh, the wreck there, uh, yeah. there is stuff growing on it. So I would probably say it's also about the same. Um, let me ask this question about uh, related to the video that uh, um, that uh, you commented on this morning, where it talks about the fishermen who would be affected by this all right um let me simplify the question he's sort of he or she is sort of asking um you know in the comment section of that video people were saying that actually the fishermen are fishing much further out they fish even up to near up island and all of that okay um so i guess what they're trying to say is well wouldn't that mean that with the reclaimed area being in the shallow portion, they can still go fish further out. What's your comment on that? Oh, my comment on that is this. If, they, if the reclaimed area happens, they won't have a choice but to fish further out, right? That's just common sense. Because there's, no, there's no, nothing, no, no, no living habitat there anymore. But uh, is that fair to them? My answer is probably not um, because... Um, they rely on it, and the relative uh, importance of those habitats is pretty high for them. Okay. It might be low for p other people, but it's pretty high for them. The other problem is this. Uh, many of these are small-scale fishers. It's not true that they can paddle all their way all, all the way to Apo Island. They may paddle offshore in search of uh, pelagic fish, and that's just part of uh, the skills and uh, the skills and the know-how of fishers, and they, they, they can do that, and they know where to get fish. But the, pro the other problem is this, if, if there's less uh, um, fish to get in close to, close to shore, most of them will be going out there. It will be harder for them to make a living 
if they're all out there in, in, in the open water, right? But um, maybe, maybe just to emphasize, no? Catches may be going down. That's, there's no doubt about that. You know, if, if catches were going up and stable, we wouldn't, be, we wouldn't have a problem, right? The fishers will, be, will have a good life. We, there will be no need for marine protected areas, right? But the reality is, you know, for many decades, catches have been going down. But even so, and I've seen this with my own eyes, fishers in Lumaguete still fish the reef and the deeper areas, even putting down traps that, that stay for one to two weeks. And I've seen those traps. Those traps, when they are hauled up, they, they, uh, they, fishers can land plenty of fish. Okay, big fish. We even have photos of that. Okay, so so I saw the video, the the movie, and I agree with that video. You know that 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 those are really important sources of food and and some livelihood for people like them who have very little other skills, you know, in order to make a living, right? So so to me, it's a it's about relative importance, okay? and that video really really makes that point. You know, food every food every so often, food every day. Who wouldn't be thankful for that? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great answer, and that actually also leads into this other question here about um, uh, what would your estimate be of the numbers of citizens who would be affected by the losses, and who would be these citizens? And if you could just reiterate what was shown in the video, I think they gave an estimate of uh, approximately. Yeah, my well, my estimate from my presentation was based on data from the Bureau of Fisheries. They say that there are uh, about close to a thousand registered fishers, right? And and all people who not only fishers but who are in the in the um, who are associated with fishing livelihoods, and then they have their families. So so that's a direct um, that's a mo more direct effect, but. Um, there are seven coastal barangays, and there are people who are living in those coastal barangays. Um, one estimate that I saw was about 38,000. So three years of, uh, of construction, three years of, uh, you know, whatever else, you know, changing environment, that's going to have an effect, right? I'm not a social scientist. I don't know what will be the other effects, but I can imagine that it will really change the social landscape. Of, uh, of, of, of the coastal areas and the greater Dumaguete area over time. So, yeah. Very much so, I would think. Uh, and of course, during the construction period and all of that and rehabilitation, yeah, it's going to be a long time. Um, could you maybe give us a simple um, comparison between what you think the damage caused to the ecosystems in the reclamation in Cebu would be compared to what would happen here. Maybe you could just uh, compare it by scales or so on. Or your opinion right. on that. Yeah, yeah, it's speculative. I don't know. Well, or just give it greater or less. I haven't really looked into the, uh, in detail in the reclamation in Cebu, simply because of lack of time, you know. Um, but, um, so I can't really uh, give a direct comparison. But I seem to recall that in the in one document there was in because the it's remember it's an ECC it's a certificate saying that you can already do this but if you do if you do this you'll have to do this there there are conditions to it one of the conditions was a interesting one which is you'll have to plant a certain number of mangrove seedlings and I thought that the number was low and I thought maybe it's low because to begin with there were no not many mangroves left you know, during that time. Um, so, so, and Cebu is a far bigger city than the Maguete. So by the time that reclamation happened, the changes to the coastal environment was probably, probably a bit more comprehensive compared to a smaller city like the Maguete. So, so that's where the problem lies. You, know, you, cannot, you cannot do a direct comparison. You're talking about, I don't know, more than a million people in Cebu easily, and then less than 200,000 people in the Maguete. Yeah, so, so, yeah, it's dangerous to, to do that, I think. Uh, close to a little bit irresponsible, um, so so maybe maybe um, that should be you know, that should, you know those comparisons should be somewhat avoided you know so unless it's in valid terms yeah 
I, I think I think it's not the right argument to make, but I think just for the information of everyone, I think part of your slide explained quite a bit that there are big differences uh, ecologically. You, you were just talking about the currents and and, and, uh, and and again, sizes of the cities and all of that. Okay, so I think we can just leave it at that, that uh, that's not the right argument to, to make to compare to the other reclamation area, right? Um, I've got quite a question here for you again. This is a new question. Uh, give you, if you could give it your best shot, Mr. Dr. Abisamis. Speaking of relative importance, do you not think that the environmental conservation argument is not really important for most Dumaguete residents because these are not part of their lives? If so, should the environmental argument focus more on the detrimental effects of the reclamation that are more relevant, such as flooding, liquefaction, or do you think that the marine conservation aspect should still be on focus or part of the focus? I'll, that's my addendum there, or part of the focus. Okay. It's, it's, um, part, it's partially like a self-answering question, you know, um, because because the what's what's relevant to to you and me would be of course different. Um, so and I agree with the viewpoint that you know if you can insert other um, important uh, issues in there, why not? Right? Because it's a it's a free country. So um, ma, I, I can't say whether one is more important than the other, right? Um, I think it's important to address the other issues so that more people are involved. One thing that might, might involve all of us is something that is scary to imagine. Um, for example, um, if with a, with a modern city, modern lifestyle like that, prices will go up inevitably. So who's gonna be squeezed out? Who can remain? Who can participate in the economy? So, so that will affect all of us. So it's important that everyone's informed and this lecture, not, not this learning event is really important because there will be other topics uh, to, I think that you guys will address. And yeah, ventilate those issues so that more people will be involved in understanding um, what would be the greater effect. I mean, it's only day one, so yeah. Great, great segue actually to the rest of our, our topics. Because um, again, that's, the goal of this seminar really not trying to provide just one point of view uh, focus on one aspect of this this uh, this issue covers much much you know much much more than just one simple aspect all right um, so I, I enjoin everyone to watch the succeeding uh, 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 events uh, I, tomorrow is um, about the uh, I think the sequence of the MOU, and then we by uh, Councillor Perdisa, and then we have uh, Attorney Benjamin with the legal aspects of this. So I'm not I'm not actually going to ask some of the questions regarding legal aspects here. Please tune into that that um, event for it. I'm going to leave you with one last question from. Uh, Sir John Halandoni, actually, and I'm going to simplify his question because he, he goes pretty, he thanks you for, for the presentation, very clear, um, very comprehensive, okay? But he sort of puts you in the spot <laughs> and asks, uh, if, if this reclamation gets to go signal, how far do you think you, your colleagues, the, the scientific, scientific community, uh, advocates and all would go to fight for the protection of these MPAs and ecosystems along the the Magetic shores. Well, um, I can probably only speak for myself um, because that's a pretty personal question. Um, my reaction would be as far where law would allow because it's it's pretty clear where you could um, participate. To, uh, to for your voice to be heard, and it's you know I'm not a lawyer, but uh, you know I read it sometimes and then try to understand it. And it seems that you know th these laws are actually pretty good. 
we just have to follow them. So, so yeah, um, and it's then there are there are processes there in in and there are procedures there where expert uh, expert uh, opinion, um, stu- even studies can be um, should be should be um, taken into account. Um, and if those if that doesn't happen, then we'll, we'll have um, protest for sure. Because you know, I mean, th- that's that that to me is what's happening right now. Because um, as what I've learned from hearing from somebody like Attorney Ben Amin, for example, uh, certain procedures were not uh, properly. Um, 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 they did you know a lot a lot a lot a lot of these procedures were skipped. So so yeah, um, if it's our job as citizens, I think to to um, to do that. And um, as you know, um, personally, I'll you know I'll, well, if. If there's a, if there's reason to do so, and then I have a point, yeah, I'll, I'll go for it. Maybe, but maybe the question is a little bit more leading. Like, you know, will I, will I, I don't know. Um, I don't think, because, I don't think. Become, we... become an eco-terrorist? <laughs> no, no, I don't think so. But, but uh, yeah. I, uh, um, but yeah, that's, that's personally, that's what, where I am right now. Yeah. yeah. I'll emphasize what you said. Uh, as far as the law will allow, and these are good laws. Mm. These are good laws as long as we follow these laws. Uh, I totally agree with you with that. Um, I've got a question here for the uh, proponent of the city, actually. And uh, my issue is that I, I don't have a, uh, a speaker for the city. But um, the question would have been, what is the estimated economic benefits of the project, the whole project? That way they could weigh it against what, we've just, what you've just shown as the, as the losses would be. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, sir, but I... We can't answer that in well, this forum. Well, I don't even know what the I, I have. I have some guesstimates on what the value is based on literature for for the marine ecosystems, but I don't know what the the the, the economic value is of, of the project itself. Exactly. Like what, will exactly. Be the, what will be the returns, right? So exactly. it's hard it's to speculate. True. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know what would, what the returns will be. Um, I mean, if you if somebody's investing. Uh, 23 billion you'd expect maybe i don't know hundreds of millions maybe i'm not a businessman so i don't know yeah, yeah. billions yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that would be correct um uh but no yeah we can't we can't answer that but that is an that is important data that would need to be addressed to weigh you know uh, cost benefit analysis uh, for this for this project um Minor question, has DNR said anything about this issue? Um, not, that I, not that I know of. Um, so, and that's fine um, because, because if you follow the process, it's too early. Yeah. Right, right, right. Um, one last question. Uh, in your experience, do you know of any other LGUs who are trying to restore their coral reefs in the Philippines and how successful are they? Off the top of my head, I know a few private ones, maybe, but maybe you would have a bit more because uh, they're asking about LGUs specifically that are mm-hmm. trying to restore coral reefs. Or maybe that would be better for Dr. Raimundo to answer. Um, if, if it's simply whether I know of any LGUs, yes, um, you know many? I don't. I don't. Okay. Um, but I know of uh, private entities working yeah. with um, certain groups, whether it's a barangay or. Uh, but so, so I'm not so sure what the arrangement there is. Um, but my impression, and my this is my um, frank uh, opinion, um, as what the global review suggests, many of these are pretty small scale. Um, I don't think they even reach the maximum of of, uh, of one hectare based on that study. So many of them would be in the hundreds of square meters, and that just goes to show how how uh, technically difficult these things are. And um, I wouldn't put my hopes up if you're talking about restoring hundred hundred hectares um, right now. Um, we received the warning from Dr. Raimundo. Um, um, the city did. So and she's a world expert in it. So, so um, yeah, that's, that I guess that I guess is uh, as good as it gets. Yeah. I have a I have a comment, not a question. Um, 
And uh, I totally agree with this. But for the benefit of those who are not very proficient in the English language, it would be good to use Cebuano, specifically when explaining or delving into the technical aspects of terms. But I think you've addressed this with some flyers and things like that. Dr. Abisamis, could you comment on that? that um, yes. Well, is it, in, is it if it's a general comment, no. It's a general um, comment. It's just a general comment. It, that ah, if it's a general comment, it, then yeah, um, yeah they're, they're the information, uh, at least from the ones that I'm involved with, um, are, are translated in Vinisaya. Uh, um, but for specific to this presentation, my problem is I'm not a native Vinisaya uh, or Cebuano speaker. So, but um, I think this is a uh, this is um, I think it's, it's in face it's, it's Facebook Live. You know? So I think from my impression, based on the organizers, it's, it's open to everyone. So maybe even international viewers are here. So so right now, um, I just I just made a decision to to speak in in English. So yeah. Well, Doctor Abbasan, thank you for that. Uh, I think I think that that's all the questions that we have for you today. Uh, let me wrap this up by thanking you again. And uh, uh, I must say that was an enlightening uh, presentation, uh, especially the emphasis on the interconnectivity uh, and uh, how you simplified the effects you know, uh, the impacts of it, right? Um, may I ask everyone everyone else, please uh, uh, tune in to the next episodes, all right? As we said, this is not the only focus or this is not the only issue with this reclamation. Uh, tomorrow, we've got Honorable Agustin Miguel Pincho for Jesus, uh, Dumaguete City Councilor, who will explain the legislative process uh, which led up to the Memorandum of Understanding. And then on Thursday, July 29, Attorney Golda S. Benjamin will explain the legal dimensions of the reclamation project. Okay? So, I think that's about it. If you have any closing remarks, Dr. Abisanis, leave it to you. Well, I guess uh, closing remarks are mainly for uh, giving thanks. So again, thank you for the to the organizers of this learning event. Um, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about what I know and um, to share to try to share this with a wider audience. Um, and uh, I wish you guys uh, all the best with the succeeding. Um, 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 sessions. You know. I think this is really important, and I think uh, you guys uh, deserve to be um, recognized for this. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Abizanis. Again, please be reminded that this video does not reflect on any opinion from the DC team and is only published for information purposes. Thank you for watching. If you found this video informative, please leave a comment in the section below. Subscribe to our channel and click on the notification bell so you won't miss any of our upcoming videos.